to begin tonight with a little bit of gratitude. First to you guys, you braved many puddles, and we appreciate it. <laughs> Hope the burritos were a welcome reward. But also to the ASSU, which picked up the room, the bill for the room, the bill for 28 feet of burritos, and filling out it all, they've been wonderful to deal with. I also want to thank the Watkins for coming out. Our, our speaker tonight is a fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute. He's recently the co-author of a national bestseller called Free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government. Don writes a regular column for Forbes.com and appears regularly on radio and television, including on The Guardian, USA Today, Forbes, Investors Big Business Daily, and many, many others. You can follow his work on Facebook, Twitter, or at his blog, lizafairblog.com. Tonight, he'll be talking about why businessmen do not give something back, or at least the idea about whether or not it comes, goes directly hand in hand with entrepreneurial success and the relationship between the two. He'll be discussing the idea that they have to give back. After the talk, he'll be also signing copies of his book, which you can buy for $20 or $10 if you're a student. Please give a warm welcome to Don Martin. All right, so I want to start out with a quick poll. Who here is in business or plans to go into business at some point? All right, so let's start out with what you're in store for. So if you plan on going into business or if you already are in California, these are just two, two of the regulatory codes, Title IV and Title VIII, that you are subject to. Now, that's Mr. James Madison, and as we all know, Madison was a pretty small guy, but this is ridiculous. At the federal level, it's even worse. Who here has read Ayn Rand's novel, Atlas Shrugged? Who here has not read Atlas Shrugged because it is this big? <laughs> if you were to line up on a bookshelf copies of Atlas Shrugged back to back in order to equal the number of federal regulatory pages in the Federal Register, you would need 240 copies of Atlas Shrugged. That's 30 feet of bookshelf space. Now, I, have, I love Atlas Shrugged. I've read it a number of times. I have not read it 240 times. I don't plan to read it 240 times. <laughs> Yet that, that is what we expect businessmen in this country to operate under. If you should, by some miracle, succeed in making some money under that barrage, a lot of it is taxed away. We have the highest corporate income tax in the world, just recently edging out Japan for number one. At the personal level, Successful individuals are shouldering more and more of the income tax burden. What does that amount to? Well, again, just speaking of income tax, that's more than 20%. Nearly a quarter of successful people's income is taken by the state. So we don't treat businessmen, we don't treat successful businessmen in this country particularly well. Now, why not? I mean, the basic answer, pretty simple, they're not that popular. Businessmen are not that popular, certainly not if you're successful. If you're a small businessman, okay, well, that's fine. You can go out and earn your keep. But if you actually succeed, man, your trustworthiness falls down to levels that are below organized labor and journalists. Congress is lower. However, there's a caveat here. Other people's congressmen, they're losers, and we don't trust them. But our congressman, he's great. So really what it amounts to is that successful businessmen are basically the bottom rung of society. But you don't need a poll to tell you this. It's something I think that's just obvious. We hear it every day. We see it every day in one form or another. And one way that it shows up, one way that I think crystallizes the kind of anti-business view in this culture is the notion that businessmen have to give something back. Give something back. We don't say it about teachers. We don't say it about policemen. We don't say it about journalists. We don't say it about politicians. But businessmen? If you succeed in business, you have an obligation to give something back. What does that mean? Well, basically, there's two aspects to it. You can think about it, the political and the personal. Po uh, personally, on the personal level, it means that you need to use some of the resources that you've gotten, you've received through your success to engage in philanthropy. So it's, you made some money, well, now you have to give it away in one form or another. Politically, what it means is that you can't object when the government wants to take some of that income and use it for its purposes. You, you've heard the president before say, 
you know, the, the, there's some people in this country who are the lucky ones, and uh, they need to give something back, which really means give something to me to do with what I want. So that's, in essence, what this give back view is. And I have to tell you, I, I always, the, the, the phrase always made me a little bit uncomfortable, but as I started reflecting on it and thinking about it, it really started to bother me because it seemed profoundly unjust and there was kind of an implication, not kind of, there really was an implication that there was something fundamentally wrong about business that businessmen had to atone for. So what I want to talk about for the next 20, 25 minutes is where does this view come from? And I want us to start to question and see, does it really make sense, this notion of giving back? So that's kind of our agenda, and then we'll open it up for questions. So, where does the giving back idea start from? Well, what it really starts from is a certain view of the world. Um, has anybody seen the movie Wall Street? It was an 80s movie. Michael Douglas, like the first cell phones that he was trucking around on a forklift. Uh, there is a famous line from that movie where Douglas says to his, uh, his the kiddie's mentor, he says, it's a zero-sum game, kid. Somebody wins, somebody loses. The giving back philosophy really starts from this view that it, life is a zero-sum game and that for one person to win, it has to come at the expense of other people. You've probably heard the economy, wealth, referred to as a pie, right? And the analogy is supposed to be there's this fixed pie, and if you get a really big slice, that means there's less for the rest of us. So there's this basic view that wealth and success is this zero-sum game, and there's going to be this battle for it. So what happens then? What's the implication of that? Well, the implication is your success comes at other people's expense. You got, you got where you got by taking a lot of their pie, so you have to give back some of the pie. It's kind of gross, but I mean, that's the implication. If you don't, well, you're not a particularly good person. In other words, if life is a zero-sum game, we can divide the world into giving and taking, givers and takers. Well, surely these profit seekers are not givers. And so, you know, if you take a little bit, that's fine. You've got to make a living, right? We're okay with that. That's what the small business is, right? He, he's a person who's he's taking a little, but you've got to give something back. That's what's going to make you a good person. If you don't, well, you're greedy. You're greedy, immoral, and the kind of person who's 100% maniacally consistent about taking and not giving, well, that's a Bernie Madoff, right? So Bernie Madoff is just the climax of what a businessman is. He's a person who never gives, just takes, 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 takes. Now, you might think at this point, look, that's not what I think of when I use the phrase giving back. I mean just more being benevolent, wanting to help people. Now, I'm going to talk about that later, but I just want to say right now, I don't think that is the ideal and the idea that's behind this phrase and why it's so prevalent. But we'll come back to that. So the real climax then, what this all adds up to is a vision of businessmen that treats them as basically almost criminals. There's an old Saturday Night Live skit with Dan Aykroyd in which he plays a uh, toy salesman to children. Only what he sells are incredibly dangerous products. So there's Peggy's home ear piercing set. <laughs> and my personal favorite, bag of glass. Now you might be thinking, what could that possibly be? It's a bag of jagged bits of glass. Now, lest you think that he's completely heartless, he says, there's a warning label on it. He says, hey kid, be careful, broken glass. But it's funny, and it's funny because that's basically we, that's plausible, right? Like, that is our view of businessmen. If they could make a buck by selling children broken glass, well, hey, well, of course they would do it. After all, these are takers, not givers. Politically, where does this all end up? Well, to coin a phrase, you didn't build that. Well, of course you didn't build that. Your success came at other people's expense. You got there on their backs, and so, and so now you have to atone for it by paying on the back end. And that then is going to take the form of more regulation, more taxation, more wealth redistribution. So we see that there's political implications. There's implications for the freedom and income of businessmen if we take this idea of give back seriously. 
Now I want to talk about an alternative way about thinking about business. Um, I guess it was, wow, uh, six, seven months ago, I do a lot of traveling for my work, a lot of air travel, which I hate. And uh, the, I, I, on this trip, I was coming back from DC, and I was in the very back of the plane on the window seat. And if any of you who travel a lot, you know the very back of the plane is not where you want to be. Uh, in fact, I think this whole debate over waterboarding uh, potential terrorists, that's ridiculous. Put them on a United flight, sit them in the very back, stick them against the window. They will give up within half an hour. So anyway, I'm sitting there, and I, I, I'm squished up against the window, but there is a ray of light at the end of the tunnel, it seems, which is that the door is about to close. Nobody has a watch nowadays. I'm looking at my <laughs> cell phone. The door is about to close, and there's nobody seated next to me. And I had one of those moments where I just thought, this, this could actually be an OK five hours. But sure enough, at the last second, this woman barrels in. It was like out of a movie, like she was carrying ski equipment or something. She's barreling to the back of the plane with this huge bag. And of course, my eyes are darting around going, where is she sitting? Because it surely is not next to me. But of course, of course it was. So she's trying to push this giant bag under the seat in front of her. And the stewardess is telling her, we got to take off. It's never going to fit. She goes, it always fits. And then she stops. She reaches into the bag, and she pulls out hardback cover copy of Atlas Shrugged. And I said, we need to talk. <laughs> and we did talk. And it turned out that she actually had been in DC for a year working for a congressman. She was a medical doctor, working for a congressman to fight government intrusion in health care. And she had been really, really frustrated by the rhetoric used to sell um, what you know is commonly called Obamacare. And what really disturbed her, and maybe you remember this, was that one of the arguments the president trotted out was the idea that doctors were performing unnecessary tests and surgeries on children in order to get a buck. And she was baffled by it. And so somebody said to her, he said, you need to read this book because it will, it will show you why there are these attacks on people for the seeking profit and what's wrong with those attacks. And I think that is definitely true. The, the vision of business you see in Atlas is one very different from the one we hear around us today. And I would argue it actually better matches reality. Um, we'll see. If the give something back view of the world starts with the idea that life is a zero sum game, the Atlas view of the world starts with the idea that life is not a zero sum game. That the world is not divided into givers and takers because there is such a thing as creators. Imagine you're on a desert island. On a desert island, there is no wealth, right? There's natural resources. I mean, there's, there's raw materials all around you. But in order for there to be wealth, stuff that actually makes your life livable and enjoyable and gives you a standard of living, you have to do something, right? You have to do really two things. You have to look around you and figure out, what can I do with this stuff? And then, number two, you have to do it. You have to take productive action. So let's say you see a tree. Now, a tree is just a tree. Maybe you can use it for shade, but at least you have to lug yourself over there. Uh, the, the, you see it, you see, all right, I can turn that into, say, a spear. So you go over and you break off a branch and you sharpen the end of a rock. Now you have a spear. Now you have a tool. You have wealth, something you can use <coughs> to get food to actually support your life. Now, let's assume there are other people on the island. Did you get your wealth at their expense? Was it taken from them? No, it was created. You took what was in nature and you made it more valuable. And this, no matter how complex the process we're talking about, this is all that we do in business and in economy, is we take the stuff of nature and we transform it into more valuable stuff. This room around us, the building, the fact that it's warm in here and not cold like outside, the fact that we were able to get here without walking, most of us. The fact that we have clothing. The fact that we got to eat a 20,000 foot sub or, or whatever the food was. All of this stuff, all of this stuff was created. This was not stuff that we just plucked off the ground, right? It was created by individuals. It was taken from nature and transformed into something more valuable. And this is going to be key to understanding what business is all about because it's not giving and taking, it's creating. Now. What do we do then when we're dealing with other people? Well, basically, you create, I create, and then, and then we trade. You go to a farmer's market, and 
you buy a potato for a dollar. I don't know, is that too much for a potato? I don't know what prices would be. Let's assume that it's a giant, delicious potato, uh, you know, already pre-carved into fry slices. And you, so anyway, you pay a dollar for the potato. Who, who came out on, the, on the, the low end of that? Who, got, who lost in that scenario, you or the guy who sold you the potato? Neither, right? It was win-win. That's why you engaged in the transaction. He valued the dollar more than the potato. You valued the potato more than the dollar, as insane as you were for that choice. And both of you are better off. Well, this is the model of all, basic, of all the economic relationships in a free country, is people trade when they view that mutually they'll be better off. It is a win-win relationship. So that when we're thinking about business, no matter how complex the transaction, what you're really dealing with is producing and then win-win trade. Now, there are plausible examples, though, where it seems that somebody is winning at somebody else's expense, right? I mean, we can think of a number of them. Um, just take, for instance, take two people competing for a job. One person gets it, the other person doesn't. Or take, you know, CEO getting a certain amount of pay, right? The more he gets paid, it seems that there's less left for other people at the company. But when you think about it, when you look at the whole context in the big picture, it's still not true. It's not true. It's in fact win-win. Now, how is that? Um, what was the first example I gave? Two people, two people looking for a job. Right. So two people looking for a job. This certainly is true. Only one person can get the job. But you have to look at the broader context, which is that we both win by living in a society where we're free to compete for jobs and where job creators are free to give them to the best person rather than just have them dictated by the government, like feudalism, right? So we both win even if in any given transaction, I mean, that's inherent in there being a, com a, a, a competition and freedom in jobs, is that sometimes I'm going to get the job I want, sometimes I'm not, but we both gain by living in that society. Moreover, it wasn't like I took the job from you, it wasn't your job to begin with, or vice versa. In the overall picture, we're both able to win, we're both able to benefit, and the real key of the win-win nature of the transaction is the fact that both you and the employer win. As far as the CEO pay, I mean, take, take Apple. Steve Jobs made quite a bit of money um, at Apple, right? Was that at the expense of the other employees? Would they have gotten more money if, he wouldn't have, if they wouldn't have been paying him so much? No, because the whole fact is there wouldn't have been an Apple to pay anybody if it weren't for him. The, the very fact that a company pays a CEO a given amount means precisely that they view his contribution as more than that amount, <coughs> that he's actually expanding the pie, if you want to use that analogy, which I'd prefer that you did it. If you want to use that analogy, he's expanding the pie. And so, yes, he is getting a certain amount, but that wasn't taken from other people. That is an indication of his own additional contribution to the company. So if we look at these case by case, what, we're, what the overall picture that emerges is production and win-win trade, not the view that you get ahead by, quote, taking. But this is an understatement. And it's an understatement because it's too defensive. Basically, what have we established so far? Businessmen aren't criminals. Whoop-de-doo. That is not really a, like ringing endorsement to say that somebody's not a monster. The fact is that business is one of the greatest forces for good in the world. And I want to make this point by contrasting it with philanthropy. Now, let me say at the outset, I'm not against philanthropy. I mean, who's, there, you couldn't be against philanthropy. Like, that would just be a ridiculous position. My point is not that. My point is that if we want to look at what has actually done good for human life, then business outweighs the good philanthropies done by a mile, by a mile. Think of the United States and think of what created the United States. Think of what took us from a wilderness into a world where the streets were paved with gold, for those of us who loved Fievel and American Tale. <laughs> the, it was not philanthropy. America was not created by philanthropists. It was created by businessmen. Take every major advance in technology, in communication, in uh, food, all of it. All of it was spearheaded by businessmen. And even in cases, even in cases, say, with uh, uh, medicines and uh, medical discoveries, where philanthropy has played an important role, profit seekers did too. 
And indeed, it's even more than that, because let's remember, where is the money for philanthropy coming from? It's coming from profit seekers. It's business that deserves the greatest credit for transforming us into a modern society as opposed to one living at a pretty low standard of living. Just to give you a couple quick indications, if we look at the um, GDP per capita in this country, which is a good, rough, but pretty good measure of the regular average person's standard of living, it was business that drove it from basically just over $1,000 inflation adjusted, I think $1990, to about thirty to 40000 uh, today. I mean, that is a thirty to 40 fold increase in people's standard of living. That is incredible, and it was made possible by profit seekers. In terms of lifespan, it's what brought us from living for just under 40 to almost 80 years old. If you look just at agriculture, just at this one zone, it used to be that most of us had to farm, right? There was no solution because you could barely produce more than what your own family consumed. There was a little bit more, enough that we could actually have some small scale cities. But in general, everybody had to make food because otherwise we wouldn't be able to eat. It was profit seekers who changed that such that today, very few Americans are involved in the production of food and we can feed not only all of America, but most of the globe. And what made it possible was innovation and technology by people trying to make a buck. Industrial farming was a product of people seeking profits, not philanthropists. And yet it has ended the problem of hunger for most of the world. We can see this even more strikingly, I think, if we look at two of the greatest businessmen and philanthropists in history, Andrew Carnegie and, Steve, and uh, uh, Bill Gates. I made Carnegie bigger because he's better. <laughs> so both of them made some of the biggest fortunes in history, right? Carnegie was through steel primarily, Gates through windows, uh, but they were also um, Carnegie gave away virtually all of his uh, money and Gates is on the path to doing something very similar. Both of them some of the greatest businessmen and greatest philanthropists. But what really has done the most good for human life? Was it their business or their philanthropy? Was it making their fortune or giving away their fortune? If you stop and think about it, it was by a mile making their fortunes. Take Carnegie. If you don't know history, um, the, I mean, Carnegie basically, through his uh, steel company, built America. Whether it was the railroads, the cities, it was Carnegie's steel that made it possible. And if you just think about how much safer life became, how much more productive we became, because now we could ship goods quickly and safely across vast distances, how much better life was, because now instead of spending months trekking from one side of the continent to the other, you could do it in a matter of days. These were huge achievements that he helped make possible. Gates, of course. Now, look, I am not a Windows fan. I use all Apple products except for uh, uh, Word because my editors use that. But uh, other than that, like, I, I, I'm not a fan. But nevertheless, it's still true that what Gates created, the reason why he was so successful and made so much money was why. Like, how did they get their fortunes? Where did their fortunes come from? It came from the voluntary choices of a whole bunch of people to buy their stuff, to give them money. Every single dime that they got, every single penny that they got was the product of voluntary choices of people to deal with them. And it was because they were offering an immense value. How much more productive are we because of Windows? I mean, the fact is that interconnectivity, the fact that everybody was on a similar platform, I mean, these things made possible so much of the tech revolution that we've seen in the last 20, 30 years. That is an amazing, amazing contribution. And no matter how many malaria nets uh, he gives away, which is a fine thing to do, that will not do for human beings what Windows did. So what is the political implications then of this view of business, of a view of business as a creative win-win process that revolutionizes and improves human life? Well, the political implications are very clear. You should have the freedom to engage in that process. And if you succeed, you should have the freedom to do with your wealth what you choose. In other words, this is the foundation of capitalism, the foundation of a system in which the government's role is to protect our freedom, 
not to seize a whole bunch of people's wealth and tell them that they can't engage in voluntary business transactions because they're greedy creeps. Now, I, wanna, I said I was going to come back to the uh, view that I think a lot of people hold, which is the give back philosophy. They think, of, look, this is just, I, I feel good helping people. I want to do something benevolent. What's wrong with that? I, I want to stress again, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not the point that I'm making. So let me stress what point I am making. First, I want to stress that giving, quote, that philanthropy, helping others in that sense, doing something not for profit, it's not a duty. It's not a, it, we shouldn't view it as a moral duty. If you'll remember, after uh, Jobs announced his retirement, there was a slew of articles which said, yeah, he built Apple, but he didn't do any philanthropic work. I mean, imagine, this is a person who created an amazing company and made people's lives immensely better, didn't hurt anybody in the process except the feelings of some of his coworkers. <laughs> and, and that was the slam. Like, I mean, that's how you would treat somebody who revolutionized the way that we live. I mean, that is obscene. So it shouldn't be regarded as a duty. The second is it's not your basic source of virtue and shouldn't be your basic source of self-esteem. That your pride, your moral pride, should come from creating something great, not from giving away the financial results. If you want to do it out of benevolence, that's perfectly understandable. I mean, look, if you're very successful financially, there's only so many yachts you can buy. And if you look at the way that successful people behave, most of them don't go around buying 20 yachts. They want to reshape the world in the image of their values. Some of them do it by just creating a better and better company like Apple. Others do it in part by using some of their wealth for causes that they care about. No, there's nothing wrong with that, but the third point I want to make, and this is the key, whatever you call it, don't call it giving back. Don't call it giving something back because that is a, that's spitting in your own face for your real achievement. It's implying that what you did was take and now you have to atone for it. If you want to call it anything, call it, I want to, I, I don't like this phrase, but you know, you're paying it forward rather than paying something back. You are really just taking another form of pursuing your values and the things you care about. And it was made possible by your achievement, not by your sins. The result, the really tragic result, I think, of the giving back philosophy is that there is an incredible amount of unearned guilt among businessmen. An incredible amount of unearned guilt. And, I, and, and, and that bothers me for two reasons. One is it's simply unjust. If you create something great, if you achieve something great, you should be proud and you should be happy that you did that. Not feel uneasy about it or that you have something to atone for. But the second thing that I think is incredibly worrisome about the fact that there is this unearned guilt that's embedded in this give back idea is that it completely incapacitates a person's ability to fight for his freedom and fight for his rights. Think about it this way. If any of you ever been married or in a relationship and you, know, you did something you're not happy about, let's say you work too much and you, know, you feel you're not spending enough time with your wife or girlfriend or husband and you come home and he or she makes some demand that you think is completely unfair and irrational. If you feel guilty because you haven't been the uh, you know, uh, significant other you want to be, are you likely to stand up and fight? Or are you likely to say, well, who am I to, to say anything? I'm not perfect. That's exactly what happens on a world stage when it comes to these debates over business and over what happens to businessmen. If you see, for instance, the debate where the president comes out and crusades for higher taxes on the, quote, rich, even though everybody knows including him, that will make no difference to the deficit. And the fact that businessmen barely fight back, and when they do, they do a really pathetic, apologetic job, that is what you're seeing unearned guilt at work. And now I know some, uh, some people don't feel, they don't exactly identify what they feel is guilt, and they don't know where to see it, but it's all around you in the business world. If you hear people who, in private, or behind closed doors will rail about how ridiculous and unjust the latest environmentalist regulation that keeps them from building a factory is, but won't say a peep in public, that is guilt. When you see a businessman try to defend his business or his income on the grounds that it's creating jobs for other people, on the grounds that, hey, our, our, our profits are only a little fraction of our revenue, 
on the grounds that we do a lot of good charity or engage in a lot of corporate social responsibility. All of that, all of that is indications that unearned guilt are at work. Anytime you see them berating inequality, not hardship, not poverty, but just sheer disparity of income. Anytime you see somebody uncomfortable saying, I'm rich and I earned it. Anytime uh, you hear somebody attach a modifier to capitalism before they endorse it. Oh, I'm for compassionate capitalism, or what's the latest one that John Mackey has? Conscious, capital. conscious, capi conscious capitalism. I guess before it was just sleepy capitalism or something. <laughs> That is all motivated by unearned guilt, and that is tragic. What's the solution? The solution is self-esteem, the self-esteem that comes from viewing your life as belonging to you, and therefore your success if you earn it as something to be proud of, unapologetic for, and to view yourself as rightfully having the freedom to spend every dime you earn through production and voluntary trade for the things that you care about in life, not for the priorities of some politician. How do we fight that then? How do you fight the idea of giving back? Well, the first thing to say is that it is an issue of ideas. Um, there's an old story, a guy uh, gets sent to prison, and the first day he is standing out in the yard and everybody's kind of gathered up, and a guy gets up in front of everybody and says, seven, and everybody starts laughing. And then another guy gets up and he says, 13. And again, everybody's just falling. And finally, this guy turns to somebody next to him and says, what's going on? And he goes, well, we only have one joke book here. And we've all memorized it. So now to save time, we just say you know, whatever the number of the joke was. He says, all right. So that night, he goes back. And he wants to fit in. So he checks out the book. And he reads through it. And so the next day, he's eager. He comes down to the yard. And everybody's gathered out in front of him. And he says, 44, dead silence. So he kind of marches back to one of the guys and says, what's wrong? 44 is a funny joke. And he goes, it is, it's funny, but it's not the joke. It's how you tell it. <laughs> it's very critical how you argue for freedom and how you make your case. But it is, in the end, an issue of ideas. And I know a lot of people, particularly if any of you are in business, a lot of businessmen don't want to hear that. They're skeptical of ideas and the power of ideas. But the fact is that an idea created Silicon Valley. An idea created the United States. A very evil idea created countries like the Soviet Union. And ideas are responsible for the trends that we're seeing today, the movement away from the Founding Fathers' ideals. And ideas, if we are to move in a better direction, ideas will be responsible. In terms of specifically how then to arm yourself with the right ideas, uh, I have two recommendations. One, read Atlas Shrugged or reread it. I think it's the most powerful presentation of the nobility of business. And not to compare the two, and immodestly, I'll endorse my own book, Free Market Revolution, which I think addresses some of these issues. But the important part, the important part is to recognize <coughs> the, this is, an, a, it is a war of ideas, and it's a war that you can win. It's a fight that you can win. People's minds can be changed. The fact is millions of people have had their view of business changed by books like Atlas Shrugged. To give you a more narrow example, I have a friend who's taken these ideas and applied them to the debate over fossil fuels. And by, by means of being able to show that fossil fuels are incredibly beneficial to human life and the people who create them are doing a great service, has actually convinced people not only to embrace fossil fuels, but to go into the industry. That, these ideas are powerful, but it's going to require a lot of work. And above all, it will require the people, the businessmen themselves, to stop getting on their knees and apologizing and accepting the idea that businessmen have some responsibility to, quote, give back. And so I'll tell you when we'll really know that better ideas are winning. It's when you get businessmen who will start a trade group, you know, the uh, ruthless profiteers for cowboy capitalism. Or more likely, even just businessmen for capitalism. Um, but with that, Thank you very much, and I look forward to taking your questions. All right, who's going to be the first brave soul? Yes. So um, 
Uh, I pretty much agree with, with uh, most of what you said. All right, next question. <laughs> but, but I just want to raise an issue. Sure. I think it's great that you're talking to everybody about capitalism, especially here. I hope a lot of people are becoming entrepreneurs and going out there and spreading the word. But I think you've got, and I, I, I actually I haven't heard anybody else I've talked about it. I haven't heard anybody else talk about the guilt of successful business people. Because I think that's why Silicon Valley is so left-wing and anti-capitalist, that the leaders here are so left-wing and anti-capitalism. But I think the other thing that that's, makes this more difficult is that you've got a PR issue. When the media is talking about this, when, when, the, when even Steve Jobs talks about stuff like this, about giving back, and Bill Gates talks about it, then you've got the public saying, I want to buy a product from a company that give, you know, whose, whose CEOs and founders give back. And so I think that's why you've got CEOs, some CEOs talking in private and saying that uh, you know, capitalism's great and it does all this great stuff, but in public, if they want people to buy their product, they unfortunately have to go out and say, well, it's not so great, and I can use, ch use charities, things like that. Yeah, so the, the comment is that um, there is a PR aspect where even the businessmen who don't necessarily believe in this will in effect appease it because that's what the people want and you know you, you don't want to come out and say hey let's be unpopular particularly if you're in business right I, I think there's a truth to that but I think it's complete BS at the same time I mean because basically what you're saying is not you but this is what they're saying they're saying in effect oh the way that we're gonna maintain our popularity is to say is to imply that we're a bunch of villains in effect, they're trying to appease what they need to fight and it's what, they, what they need to do and what would actually work because look, they've been trying this strategy for 50 or 100 years. If it really worked to come out and say, well, of course we're bad, but we give something back and that makes us good, then it would have worked by now. They, would have actually, they wouldn't be at that bottom of that chart in terms of who people trust and of their view of business. What they should do is actually come out and defend what they're doing aspirationally, which is if you can come out and say, uh, no, I don't give back. I create, and that is something that's really good. I, the fact is that I think people are open to that message. I don't think a lot of people buy from companies because they, quote, give back. I mean, that, there's kind of a marginal element that does it. Um, and I think, more importantly, they're being slaughtered. They're being slaughtered and drowned in regulations, controls, taxes, and everything else. Uh, the, the idea that they might lose a couple sales because they come out and are self-confident in defense of their, th themselves and their business, I just don't buy it. I think that, but what happens is they don't know how to defend themselves because they, th they think that defending business means coming out and doing what Mitt Romney did. Lord knows, I mean, what day of the week he did, but uh, you know, depending on what side of the bed he got out on, but it would be some form of, I created job, like those examples I gave. They view themselves as defending business when they say, oh, we create jobs or so on. No, you have to get out there and say, I create wealth, and I'm very proud of it, and I didn't do it at anybody's expense, and nobody should interfere with that. Uh, I think the basic answer is look at the track record, and so far the track record of the attempt to appease these ideas has been really bad. But you're right, I think that's very, uh, plays into, I regard that as how they rationalize not fighting back, not a real reason. So two of the first responses I'd expect, like, uh, I don't know, any of my friends to give to some of your points were, I mean, one, when you're talking about, you know, creating a steer on, on an island and that's creating value, I mean, couldn't people, one, like, argue that then there's marginally less supplies to create future things and then eventually that, that's a depletion of, you know, resources that is in a way taking away from other people? And then the second, uh, concept is just responding, is when people say, like, I created this, I, I created value, addressing the, the, the concept of like a level playing field. Like some people starting off, you know, uh, with a poor background. Like how do you respond to that? Okay, um, don't forget your question, because I might. <laughs> uh, but to the, so the first one is basically, isn't it, is a person really creating? Because obviously he's taking something from nature, and so there's now less in nature. No, that is not the right way to think about it because the fact is that nature doesn't give us resources. All there are are raw materials, but until a human being identifies their capabilities and does something to make them useful, it, 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 there's not like wealth there that he's now depleting. He's, he really is making something new. He's rearranging the given. And so that's why what we see, and if you actually look at what happens, is as history progresses and as we engage in more and more production, 
we get more and more resources. So if, if that vision of the world were true, then you would expect, for instance, to see that there's uh, less and less, say, oil available to us. But in fact, there's more and more oil available to us because we discover means and methods for finding it, for accessing it, for using it for human life. And that process goes on with every raw material such that um, if you look at the history, uh, we haven't run out of any so-called non-renewable resource ever. It hasn't happened because the ingenuity of the human mind finds new ways to get it and new ways to use it. And if and, and, and the forces of economics, to the extent a country's free, make it profitable when the amount of some given resource starts to decline relative to people's demand, it makes it profitable to find substitutes, to find new sources, to find new uses. And so uh, even on the island, look, the fact is that what that person does now that he has a spear, it's not like there's fewer, I mean, you could say, oh, there's fewer branches for people to break off. But if you look at the big picture, what it means is now there's more fish for them to eat. So when they go and they make their own spears and do their work, now they can trade and everybody is more bountiful. <coughs> so it's not that they're warring over a fixed amount, it's that they're using nature for their goods. Now you can, I mean, you can create a scenario where they're on such a limited part of nature that there's no way to survive. But that's, I mean, that's not the world we live in. What, uh, our problem today is not the fact that the world only has so much. It's the fact that we only have so much time to exploit the world and only so much freedom, unfortunately. Uh, second question. The level playing field. Level playing field. Well, the, see, but the, the whole setup there. So the, the, the question here amounts to the idea of um, how, how would you kind of summarize it? Basically, they would say, look, you're, no, you're, you're presenting this picture where everybody's uh, engaging in these win-win transactions, but everybody's not starting from a level playing field. But that misconceives what the goal is. It's not like a race. Like the co competition is not me trying to beat you and you trying to beat me, except in a very delimited sense. The fact is that we can all get rich together. And so, you know, one business might go out of business, but that doesn't mean we slaughter you. Like, you, you don't get killed. You go start another business or find another role in the productive economy where you're more productive. So the, the basic point is that it's not a race. And so, yeah, there's not a level playing field. Some people are smarter. Some people are prettier. Some people, uh, you know, happen to have, they have, you know, better parents, they have richer parents, they have more connections. There's all these differences. But th 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 that doesn't matter precisely because success doesn't come at other people's expense. So yeah, if a person starts out up here, he might achieve a lot more. But all that means, but that wasn't taken from me. It just means that he was able to achieve a whole lot, to create a whole lot on his own. And the fact is that to the extent a country is free, those differences really, in the end, don't make too much of a difference. I mentioned Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie was a uh, immigrant from Scotland. Came here when he was 12. Started working when he was in thir when he was 13 uh, in a factory. He had only four or five years of education. Started working for uh, a little a, a dollar 15, not an hour, not a day, but a week. But that was enough because he was able to show his ability, learn new skills and grow from there. And that's exactly what happens is that any given person, um, it might be harder or easier to succeed based on his circumstances, but as long as he's free, it gives him the best chance possible, but only if he exerts the effort. Uh, if he doesn't exert effort, it doesn't matter how many quote opportunities you put into his lap because there's a bunch of people who have every opportunity under the sun and do nothing with their lives. They make nothing of their lives. They might even trip into a job that gives them some income, but they're miserable and unhappy because happiness and success ultimately come from your choices. And so if you are the kind of ambitious person like Andrew Carnegie, it doesn't matter whether you start with nothing or whether you start with everything. It's just a matter of time before you succeed barring an accident. So that's how I would answer that. All right, yes. So again, I agree with everything you've said. and I, I personally find it all sort of self-evident, but you know, there are a lot of people out there who doesn't, all this isn't self-evident. The whole idea of the fixed pie is sort of ensconced pretty firmly in a lot of people's minds and sort of in their gut level economic thinking. And, you know, you can see it in any number of ways when you debate someone on the street about you know, why does the government lower gas prices or, or you name it. And I think that because some of these ideas aren't necessarily 
uh, intuitive or self-evident to people with, without putting a little bit of time to think into it. How do you um, go about sort of getting that message out? How do you really change people's minds other than you know having them read books? What's sort of the best way to do that without you know just society coming to a collapse and then people waking up? Because I fear that may be down the road what is only what people sort of sparks them to, to understand these ideas. A lot of tweeting. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I get this question a lot, and basically it amounts to, so the, the question for those who didn't hear was, like, this stuff takes a lot of thought. What do we do about the fact that, you know, uh, how do we get people to think or think about these ideas? And there are no shortcuts. I mean, there's things you can do to try, and, and so I, I was half joking about tweeting. I mean, that's one way that you can try to get people intrigued enough that then they're going to go do the work. But there's no such thing as, well, these, this is really hard. We can't get them to think. So how do we kind of stuff into their brain otherwise? And there's, there's no way to do that. You can use different tools. So yeah, a lot of people don't read, so you can create videos. Uh, a lot of people don't read, so you can give talks. A lot of people do read, particularly the active-minded ones who really determine which direction a, a culture goes. The, uh, there's a mistaken view that we have to kind of convince the masses. Um, the masses, will they go in whatever direction the current runs. I mean, that's what makes them the masses. The question is, what determines the current? And the question, and the answer is, anybody who chooses to. And so what you have to do is you have to figure out, how do I fight to determine the current? And that really amounts to, you have to figure out the best, most effective way to make your case, and then you have to make it in the best, in the formats that you most value and that you think are most valuable. But I think a lot of times, unfortunately, there's a tendency, so you mentioned, you know, the, this, seems, this feels almost self-evident to you, and I think a lot of us can sometimes feel that. And so I get this kind of question. I'm not saying this is your motive, but often it'll be kind of, I make the greatest case in the world and these idiots don't see it. Well, the fact is, we actually tend to make a really awful case for our ideas. And most people are not idiots, it's just we're not as effective as we should be. And so I think the primary thing to do is not, is not bemoan the fact that, oh, they won't listen. It's to think, man, we need to be a lot more interesting, a lot more clear, a lot more persuasive so that they do listen and that when they hear us, they're blown away by the case. Uh, because, that, I mean, that's what works. What works is to be just way better than the other side. And if you're an unpopular minority, you have to be really, really, really better than the other side. Uh, so I think that's where we should strive, not to look for shortcuts, but to look for improvement in ourselves. Yes? In the spirit of making a, a good case, suppose I say, You've painted a very good picture uh, on an island. I'll buy the ca free market capitalism would work on the island when there is a much simpler times a simpler world. But the modern world is much more complicated. And we actually have run out of resources like whale oil, for instance. And not business doesn't create all of the wealth. Sometimes the government does do take DARPA and the internet. And what, what would you say to those sort of nuanced uh, claims are like the, the claim that what you've thrown up is a straw man. It's not. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of nuanced arguments. I mean, there's a lot of details that you can't handle in, in the talk. I'll try to address some of them um, if I can remember. So, what was the, uh, we are running out of resources. Not true. So, whale oil is a perfect example. So, first of all, I said, not quote, non renewable. Uh, a whale is supposed to be a renewable resource, right? Um, no, and, but, but the whales were running out. But what saved them? Why do we still have whales? Because we used to use them to light our homes. You know, whale oil was used to light homes, although most people didn't use it because it was really expensive because, man, those whales, they're big, but they're hard to get. Uh, the Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller saved the whales by making kerosene available to the masses cheap and safe. It was, in other words, capitalism and progress, and energy progress, that actually saved the whales. Now, there is a whaling problem, but the problem is that there's not private property in the ocean. And so you have what's in economics called the problem of the commons, which is that the problem is we have a commons. And so uh, it's in everybody, it's in any given person's interest to just snatch what they can. Whereas if you have private property, why haven't we run out of trees? We use a lot more trees than we do whales. It's because the, for many of the forests, not all of them, are, are privately owned. And so if I own a forest that I'm leasing to people who log them for, tree, uh, for paper, let's say, or you know, wood, wood resources, 
You better believe I'm going to make sure that I'm going to plant new trees so that I continue to have a profitable forest. Um, the government creates wealth through things like DARPA. Look, it's definitely true, and we should be really happy when the government, through its legitimate functions, ends up stumbling on knowledge and technology that then uh, profit seekers can turn into stuff that's valuable. I mean, let's say that happened during the space uh, endeavor. It, we could assume it happens with, with DARPA, that they discover certain technologies in the process of doing legitimate government functions. Not that the space one was, but, uh, but um, you know, like military secrets. And then, yeah, it, it, that's great if they happen to discover things and then profit seekers can go create wealth. But that's not the government's job, and in general, there's a reason why everybody uses the same two or three examples. It's because those are the only two or three examples. Uh, the, the, the government is really important and really good at one thing, at the thing we need it for, the thing the Founding Fathers knew we needed it for, which is to protect us from criminals at foreign and domestic, to protect our rights and protect our freedom. That is something that the government is very important for, but it's within that span then that free people can go about creating wealth in various ways. The problem is that government is an agency of force. That's what makes it a government. What makes it a government is that it gets to dictate things uh, and, and back it up with a gun. Whereas you know, Steve Jobs can dictate to somebody, this is the way it's going to be at Apple, and then you can go, I'm leaving. Um, the, the, and so you don't want this idea that well, we'll have government just uh, produce all the things that we need or any of the things that we need. The problem there is that it's, it's a, it's bad at it, but B, it's wrong because what it really means is that you have a bunch of people who are um, seizing wealth from others and using them for undertakings that they may not approve of or that they may have no interest in. So just to give you a concrete example of that, uh, government producing health care. So a lot of people think, oh, that's, you know, th there's a good way that the government can create, you know, a resource for everybody. So first of all, the funds for that, where are they going to come from? They're going to come from other people who produced it. It's, uh, how does it give it to people? Well, only by violating the rights of people, both the ones who are paying for it, the people forced in the system who don't want to be in the system, the doctors who are forced to operate in that system, who don't want to operate in that system, and who, to the extent that they can flee the country, tend to flee those countries for more freer systems. So the, um, the, there are nuances, but the nuance is what you want is a system in which government protects freedom and then free people create, and that it's freedom that enables creation, which is why what you see when you look at, I mean, if you plot out on a globe, or you plot out on, on, on a, uh, uh, a map, the ratio between countries' uh, standard of living and the amount of economic freedom it's a very tight relationship. It shows the more economic freedom, the more prosperous. There's a reason why Hong Kong is more prosperous than China. There's a reason that uh, North Korea is less prosperous than South Korea. Why East Germany was less prosperous than West Germany. It's because it's freedom that enables people and frees their minds to create. So I think that covers some of the issues that you named. Yes? We have there. So you seem to be basing uh, your argument on that the Earth, in fact, is not finite. Uh, you say that, well, we are not running out of resources uh, because the Earth is not resources. It's first when we sort of take goods from the Earth and, and make something out of it, it becomes a resource. But there are also studies that show that if everyone on, the, on Earth would live like the ordinary American, we would need four Earths just to sustain that lifestyle. So how does that um, work in sort of your world view? So uh, the question is, isn't the Earth finite? Come on, Don. Uh, that, no, I mean, yeah, obviously everything in the universe is finite. In, 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 the, in the metaphysical sense, everything that exists is limited, sure. But for practical purposes, no, resources are not limited precisely because we create new ones. And so those, I don't know which exactly studies you're referring to, but all of these so-called predictions and studies, what they're all based on is if we keep using up things the way that, if, if more people were using up things at the rate we currently are, then they would vanish relatively quickly. But the whole thing is if people were free to use those resources, they'd be free to create those resources at an even higher rate. So the point is that the more freedom you have, 
the more resources would get created. And the, I, I, what I would recommend above all, there's a masterful book on this very issue, it's this thick, um, by a brilliant economist named Julian Simon called The Ultimate Resource Two. And it's, it just goes into detail on resource after resource, every form of energy you can imagine, every form of metal, water, air, it tackles all of them and shows how actually we've been getting more prosperous, we've had more, we'll have better. And the fact is, the earth is nothing more than a solidly packed ball of, of resources. There's, and we've literally just been scratching the surface. There's so much more there. I mean, every prediction that we're going to run out of this or that has fallen flat. And it's precisely because people don't recognize the role of the mind and that it really is human ingenuity that drives our ability to create more and more. And there's no limit to that ingenuity. Uh, yes? So in a lot of your argument, you said that businesses create things without being at the expense of others. But I can imagine, like in a lot of scenarios, if businesses were completely free to uh, use resources as they wish, <coughs> some pretty bad things could come out. Like, for example, um, we look at sweatshop labor or uh, child labor laws. And uh -huh. the third thing would be, how does uh, pollution factor into this model? Those are good questions. Um, so the question was basically, like I'm talking about, you know, all this good that business can do, but if there's no restrictions, just, I mean, couldn't they do some awful things? And the examples that he cites are child labor, sweatshops, and pollution. So let me say, first of all, I don't think they should be able to do anything. I mean, you, you do need a government to protect rights, and I'll come back to that more about pollution. Um, so the, the businessmen should be free to do what everybody else can do, which is you're free to um, do what you want, as long as you're not violating other people's freedom and other people's rights. And, and so that's the limit, which basically means all human relationships have to be voluntary. You can't force anybody, you can't uh, coerce them. Now, to take those concrete examples, though, I don't know what a sweatshop is. A sweatshop is basically a factory that people don't like, that outsiders don't like. The people there, I mean, they choose to work there. Now, th there's a caveat here. I think a lot of so-called sweatshops it's precisely because the country isn't free and rights aren't being protected. So for instance, a lot of quote sweatshops in the United States have been because, because we egregiously violate the right of, rights of immigrants. And so their rights aren't being protected and they're scared to go to the government. And so in effect, they become slaves to people because, the, because instead of protecting their freedom to immigrate, we restrict it in all sorts of irrational ways. So I think that's completely bad. The problem, the, but the problem there is just there's not enough freedom. But yeah, are there, a lot, are there some factories, particularly in, hist in American history, that had uh, not great working conditions? Yeah, definitely. But if people chose to work there, it was only because it was the best option available at the time. And so we can't just impose our standards on them uh, 100 years in the future when we're much richer and better off and have better options, which leads me to the child labor example. You, you do realize that children have worked throughout history. This is not something created by businessmen or created by capitalism. Why did children work? Was it because parents hate their children? It's because otherwise they're gonna starve to death, right? Because during most of human history, we've been completely poor. Poverty is the given. That's the natural state that we're in. And it was, you work or you die. And the, I mean, that was really the scenario we were in uh, for a long time. Then it became, you work or life is really, really crummy. But as soon as we became rich enough to be able to afford not to have kids work, then parents took them uh, out of the factories and put them into schools. And businessmen were happy once to get rid of them. Because if you've ever had a five-year-old trying to you know, do anything practical for you, <laughs> this is not the most productive <laughs> endeavor. Um, child labor, is, it's unfortunate when it's necessary, but it's a travesty if you pre pre prevent it when it is necessary. Thankfully, in the United States today, the really, the, the really bad kind of child labor, where you have little kids who you want to be in school, that, that wouldn't be an issue without those laws. And indeed, even in America, child labor was going away well before we had anti-child labor laws. I mean, it's just a historic fact. Um, today, I, I, the worst thing about child labor laws is it actually prevents 
kids who want to do something entrepreneurial rather than sit and watch TV, it prevents them from doing it. Uh, Steve Martin, one of my favorite stand-up comedians, he writes about his early experience working at Disney uh, Land down where I uh, live. Um, it's how he got his experience. It's what motivated him and drove him. And he goes, I was breaking all kinds of child labor laws when I was doing it. And that's true. A lot of these kids, it's, oh, no, you can't actually go do anything productive with yourself. You need to go play Nintendo. I think that's egregious. Uh, the, uh, I think one of the best things a young person can do is work. Not at the expense of school, but you know, in addition to it. Pollution is exactly one of the things that um, is an issue solved and properly solved by property rights. So <clears throat> if you dump your garbage in my lawn, you don't have the right to do that. It's my property. If you dump it in uh, my river, let's say, you don't have a right to do that necessarily. That's my property. I mean, we might work out a contractual agreement where I let you, uh, you pay me to let your factory put some stuff in, you know, my, in a, the river that flows onto my property. But, but, the, but the basic issue is that all of that is worked out through property rights. And how do you work it out in every given detail? Like that's something that um, legal theorists and scholars deal with. And I mean, there's a lot of uh, case law on this, particularly from the 19th century, particularly dealing with water rights. But basically the issue is just the government has to define what property rights are and then, and then you don't have a right to engage in pollution that interferes with a person's property rights. You want to look, follow up. Uh, like outsource their manufacturing to China where there's much less um, pollution regulation? Um, well, I, I don't have a problem with outsourcing. I mean, out, outsourcing is just an issue of freedom. The problem in China is precisely that they don't protect property rights. But the, the problem is not then to fight outsourcing, which just means the freedom to uh, allow people who live in other countries to help you produce. What you do is you, you say, China, you should have better laws regarding pollution. And I, I agree that they should. Um, there's, there's things that they should be doing, say, with coal plants that um, are very low cost and that are completely appropriate for the level of development they've had. Um, that they're not doing. I do, I do think that's a legitimate complaint, but you don't blame the businessmen. You blame the politicians. Yes? So some of your points, like when you're talking about how business had increased life expectancy, I think the single biggest thing that did that was clean water supply, which primarily was a government function through public health departments and, and providing clean water. Um, and pollution into the air is the kind of thing that theorists did look at and said, okay, well, it affects everybody or it spreads, that that's best handled by a representative government, because looking out for all of us, because there's, I can't come and say, you know, something that this businessman did polluted one millionth of my air and this one didn't. No, you, have to, you deal with it as a system, as a whole. Um, food well, safety is another thing that we're, you know, I want to be able to produce milk, you want to be able to produce milk, what we need is really consistent standards so that we can compete honestly without having to drive down the quality of what we're producing. Okay, well those are three very different questions, but very good. Well, let, let, let me start with the three before we go on to more. I just want to get to the one most important, I okay. think, the, it, which is I keep waiting for this country to have enough faith in free markets to say as to climate instability and carbon emissions, we need to tax the emissions enough to free up the entrepreneurial energy to, you know, have a, to say, okay, we, we know we can't afford to keep putting junk uh -huh. into the air because we're losing our stable climate, which underpins everything. But this, ha this room is full of people who could go out and figure out ways to do things cleanly without carbon emissions, but only if they can do it economically and compete. Um, all right. Well, you'll have to remind me of the earlier ones because I want to take that one first because I think yeah. that I've talked a little bit about uh, air pollution, so I should talk about climate. So I don't, I don't believe that our society depends on a, quote, stable climate. There's no such thing as a stable climate. What it depends upon is the freedom to deal with whatever climate is necessary. If you look at the United States, people thrive in every sort of climate. If you look at poor countries, 
they completely don't thrive even if they have a really great climate. What people need is the freedom to adapt to whatever climate there is. And so the assault on fossil fuels, which have been the biggest boon to our ability to live in the name of keeping the temperature the same, I think is insane. I think it is one of the most dangerous, wrong crusades that people have been on. What we need is precisely the freedom to use more and more fossil fuels so that we can deal with uh, whatever climate actually takes place. The, if you look at climate-related deaths over the last 100 years, they've completely collapsed because we've become much better, to de we, much better able to deal with climate precisely because we have a, a bunch of technologies and the freedom to use them. So I think basically putting a, a tax on people for the so-called pollution of carbon I think is completely wrong and would be a disaster. It would and it, it particularly be a disaster to our environment. We would not be able to keep improving the human environment on the scale that we now do if we weren't able to use fossil fuels, which at this stage in our development are the, the, one of the uh, only ways that we can power an industrial society and an industrial civilization. So to go to some of the other examples um, that you mentioned, uh, the first one, it, it's definitely true that, I mean, clean water was one of the key things. I, don't, I wouldn't say it was necessarily the key one, um, but it was definitely one of the key things. But, that, but A, a lot of the technologies that were developed were developed by profit seekers. And it's a historic accident that it was done by government. The government shouldn't have had control over the sanitation. And indeed, in, it, it depended on what locality you were talking about, whether or not it did. Today, you know, obviously government always handles uh, kind of infrastructure things. But it, there was much more uh, variation in that when this was first being set up during the 19th century. Most, most places it was local governments of some form, but not always. But that, but that doesn't destroy my point. My point is that all these technologies w tended to be developed by people in pursuit of profits. And so you can certainly point to some good technologies that came about in, in, and were set up in other ways. But that, I mean, that uh, it, it doesn't exactly bear on the point that I was making, which is just that the key thing that was improving human life was the general pursuit of people of uh, profit. So the um, what was the there was one or two more? Food oh, food example. safety. No, food safety. So first of all, remember, there's protection of rights is the cornerstone. And so if you poison somebody, you don't have a right to poison somebody. But you don't also have the government dictating what counts as food safety. Because uh, the, the fact is, as long as the relationships are voluntary, that's for individuals to judge for themselves. And one of the ways in which they do judge is you have private competing certifications and inspections. Um, in effect, you have private regulators who compete in a market to say, this is what constitutes, this is what we judge as constituting safe food. And the reason that you do that, apart from just the sheer fact of having freedom, is because you want competition in what counts as safety and how safety is assessed. You don't want it dictated. Because the fact is that you want innovation in and in, in how you pursue that. Let me give you a, a slightly different example, and then I'll come back to food. There's, a, an, if you're t again, a stack of codes and regulations this thick on, say, how we run gas lines into homes. And you think, well, that's a really good thing, right? Because we don't want homes to explode. Of course, nobody wants homes to explode. And profit seekers have a very big incentive to make <coughs> sure that their homes don't explode. But because it's dictated down to the detail about exactly what you do to run gas lines, an innovator has no incentive and no freedom to say, hey, I can do it better. I can do it safer. I can do it more cheaply. And you want that freedom to experiment and that freedom to innovate in those realms. And so the same is true in food safety. Food safety is a value created by profit seekers. It's not something imposed upon them by government. Because if you're McDonald's, how much is it going to increase your profits to poison your customers? Not a lot. Uh, you have a huge incentive for safety. And so what you want is you want just the most freedom to experiment and find the best ways of ensuring safe food. And indeed, um, it's m the market, not government dictates, that has made food safer and safer, thankfully. We've got time for one more question. Oh, wow, that's quick. Um, who hasn't asked one? Okay. Oh, well, you don't have one, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my bad. All right. 
Uh, yes. So first, I would add just a humble suggestion. I think in American Tale, uh, it was actually paper cheese, not gold. But uh, a second thought, a lot of the different questions here have sort of uh, divorced the idea of time span. Uh, Joe Lonsdale recently penned an op-ed, uh, you might have read it, that said, Silicon Valley needs more of a culture of duty because right now all the incentives are to write an app for social media or something like that. And people aren't really working on the big problems like uh, maybe extending the resources that we have right now. And I definitely believe in the self-healing uh, properties of free market share and how you know the value of solving a problem is directly you know, tied to how much other people value you solving this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with things like food safety, air quality, those sorts of things, or McDonald's poisoning its customers. Uh, if McDonald's slowly over time poisons its uh, customers, where nobody knows over 30 years, it might actually be in their benefit. Is there some sort of function in the free market that would sort of incentivize, uh, you know, farsightedness? Because how are we going to uh, regulate some of these things or, you know, incentivize good behavior over the long term as opposed to incentivizing right now? Because while you're, tr while it's true that uh, it would be bad for McDonald's to poison its customers. If nobody knew about it over 30, 40 years, like tobacco companies, let's say, uh, we, we didn't know that it was good or bad. And the incentives right then, it might be too late to change it after 40 or 50 years. So, uh, so, so the question So who's this far-sighted government who's... No, no, I'm saying for individuals. <laughs> uh -huh. for, the, for the actual innovators, because right now, I, I do kind of feel that the incentives out in the market are not to fix huge problems because it's way too hard to do. Uh, you know, you might get a hundred billion dollars if you, you know, make energy clean for everyone and free, but no one can work on that problem, so they all write apps and things like that. So, is there a function in the free market that would allow incentives to be matched towards the value that they would have over time? I mean, the, so the, to boil down the question, it's basically how do we make free markets long range? Um, and I think they are. I actually, I, I disagree with the premise. And, they're, and, they're, and I mean, one way that you can see this is that the freer culture and the uh, more rational culture, the lower interest rates are, tend to be. That's just one measure. But the fact is that what capitalism incentivizes is precisely a long range view. And that's because there's a whole bunch of free people who are making assessments about how they're going to deal with you. And so, for instance, uh, I mean, if nobody can tell that they're, quote, being poisoned over 30 years, which is not, I mean, it's not even clear what that means, um, the, then, I mean, there's nothing that you can do about it anyway. But you just, what capitalism gives you is the freedom to make those discoveries, to find better ways of measuring things like poison. Or, uh, I mean, you take the smoking example. First of all, it's not really true. People knew that it was unhealthy for a lot longer than we're allegedly told. Um, the, uh, the, but the, issue is basically there has to be an assessment. Is a company violating people's rights? And if, and if so, then they can't do that. And if not, then the solution is for people voluntarily to make better decisions. And if they don't, well, then that's on them. But they can't impose those decisions on other people. So really, the long range thing is the solution is have the freedom to be long range. And if you don't think people are being long range enough, well, that's fine. Then you, then you are free to persuade them. But what you're not free to do is go dictate your standards of what's long range on them. And it's precisely that freedom, then, that gives you the biggest incentive to work on the biggest uh, problems. Some people. Some people want to work on apps, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But there's a ton of people working on the so-called big problems. I mean, you mentioned energy. Now, that's a, not a great example in a certain way, because there's a whole bunch of false government incentives to come up with you know, some, quote, green energy solution. But there's a lot of people working on those kinds of problems because they're interesting and precisely because if they do do it, I mean, they, they hit the ultimate lotto. I mean, if, if it were really true that in a market people were all short range, you wouldn't have had Silicon Valley because there was a whole bunch of people working on stuff that who knew that that was ever going to lead to anything big. But it was, these were interesting problems and people were free to try to do something with them. And so they did. Um, so I think the key to being long, long range is really a function of your freedom to think and then to plan. And what happens is the less freedom you have, the less ability to plan that you have. Let me just give you one example. Today, when 
who knows what's going to happen with the economy? Who knows what side of the bed Ben Bernanke is going to wake up on and decide that interest rates are going to be tomorrow? Who knows what in the world's going to happen once the $100 trillion in unfunded liabilities under Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security comes due? Nobody can plan for that kind of thing. And so you get a shrinking of people's time span and their ranges. But that is precisely because they didn't have a market. We don't have a free market. When we had more of a free market, before 1913 when we had the Federal Reserve, when you had inflation at 1 or 2% at most, and sometimes a, a slow but steady deflation, over long, vast periods of time, you had immense amount of stability, even including the so-called booms and busts uh, that took place. There was an immense amount of stability, and people were incredibly long-range. And I think that's exactly what you want to get back to. So thank you very much once again.